So it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Anil Cherian, who uh, is based in, in uh, South Sudan. And uh, do bear with us if we have some connection challenges today. We've had a little bit of trouble connecting. And uh, if he does at any point disappear, hang in there uh, because he will be back and we'll be working to get him back online. Uh, Anil is a medical doctor who originally graduated from Christian Medical College in Valor, India in 1989. And he began his medical career working in a mission hospital, in a leprosy mission hospital, and then various other Christian mission hospitals after that. And in 1994, he qualified as a pediatrician, then a master's of public health in Manila. And then if that wasn't enough, a diploma in health economics from York in the UK. And he shifted from clinical medicine into uh, community health and development, and then worked as the mission coordinator for EMFI. That's the Evangelical Medical Fellowship of India, uh, one of our Indian organizations affiliated with ICMBA. He was there training medical, dental, and nursing students. And uh, in 2014, Anil and his wife, Shalini, who is an obstetrician gynecologist, moved to Africa to start the ICMDA, National Institute of Health Sciences in Jongli, uh, to train healthcare professionals for South Sudan. And he worked very closely with the CMDA of South Sudan there and also Christian Medical Fellowship of Uganda. So you can see he's had an incredibly varied career across a whole host of different uh, health settings uh, and training and specialties as well. He's also been actively involved in other global health initiatives, including health systems research, and has received a number of awards for his work. Shalini and Anil have two sons, Ajay and Rohan. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Anil Cherian to speak to us on training health workers for South Sudan, a transformational ministry. Uh, I'm excited that I can give you a glimpse of our ministry and work in South Sudan. So this uh, talk is going to be done in six sections as outlined in the slide. Uh, I will begin by giving you the context and the background, uh, and that is South Sudan. As you can see on the map, South Sudan is at the intersection between uh, North Africa, Eastern Africa, and Central Africa. Uh, it became an independent country in uh, July 9th, 2011, after it uh, went through 50 years of war and conflict and oppression from the Islamic governments of the north. Uh, it geographically includes the southern region of what was previously uh, one nation of Sudan. So the northern part remains as Sudan, whereas the southern part has become the Republic of South Sudan. The people are mainly from the Nilotic tribes, and uh, whereas Sudan has uh, other Arab tribes. The land uh, is called Sudan because it is the land of the Sud. Sud is the world's biggest swamp, and as you can see, the White Nile transverses the country, traveling from the south to the north. It was also the land of the savanna grasslands and it is the home to the largest cattle rearing communities in the world today. Uh, Pratt, Gall and Han in 1997 described this as a finely honed symbiotic relationship uh, between the local ecology, the domesticated livestock and people in a resource scarce area, often at the threshold of human survival. In this picture, you can see Boat Town where we work, which is located on the eastern banks of the White Nile. And the Nile is actually a huge expanse of water with many islands in the middle. The life in South Sudan is closely associated with the River Nile and its many tributaries. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of Boat Town on an ideal day. Uh, but most of the year, nearly six or seven months in a year, we have rains. 
and it's always not clear skies like you see in this picture. Uh, the people are Nilotic tribes. The predominant tribe is the Dinka tribe. They are extremely tall, some of the tallest people in the world. And uh, they are mainly cattle keepers. So uh, this gives you an idea of what the people look like. And uh, most of their life as their cattle keepers is closely linked to their cattle. Their names, they're named after their cattle. And in this picture, you can see them parading their prize cattle. Wrestling is one of the most popular local sports. But uh, these pictures sort of paint a kind of rosy picture of the country of South Sudan. But in reality, South Sudan is a very fragile state. What do I mean by a fragile state? Uh, a fragile state is an underdeveloped country characterized by weak capacity, leaving its citizens vulnerable to a number of shocks. It usually is dependent on external aid. It has had a UN peacekeeping force for over th three years. In South Sudan, we've had a peacekeeping force for nearly 20 years and has World Bank governance score of less than 3.2 out of 10. So after ind independence, post-independence, there has been a resumption of conflict and people continue to be displaced. The conflict and fighting began between two political rivals in late 2013 and escalated into a war uh, in 2014, destabilizing the government for nearly two years. In two 2016, there was a second wave of conflict, and this went on till almost 2018. And in 2018, there was a revitalization of the peace agreement between the warring factions. In this slide, you can see uh, all the conflict and displacement in South Sudan. Uh, it is small skirmishes and battles fought mainly between different tribal groups and uh, all over the country. And uh, it is not really with external forces, but among the people. But in the process, uh, South Sudan is still continues to face one of uh, a huge humanitarian uh, crisis since 2014. Uh, the number of internally displaced persons is one point 73 million and number of people which who require assistance is nearly 3.4 million which is uh, almost 40 percent of the total population and number of food insecure people are 4.8 million uh, since september 2016 when uh, the second wave of conflict uh, began uh, tens and thousands of people have been again internally displaced and have moved uh, or have moved to the neighboring countries like Uganda. Uh, it was reported that an, on an average nearly 2,800 people were fleeing across the border to Uganda in this period of time. The South Sudan economy has been on the brink of collapse uh, with 800 percent inflation and almost no uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, the normal salaries of a government health worker cannot support his or her uh, family food needs even for a few days. It uh, almost is like the situation in uh, pre-World War II Germany when I was I have read that you know a week's uh, salary would only get you a, a, a loaf of bread. And many people uh, face food shortages during this period. In this slide, I've tried to show you and compare the uh, health statistics of South Sudan with uh, the African average and the global average, the maternal mortality, life expectancy. And you can see there's a marked disparity. Uh, this many of the statistics are from 2008 or earlier and but the life expectancy then was like 42 compared to the average of uh, africa which is 54 
and much less than the world average of 68. So you can see that there is a huge disparity in health. Uh, more definitely, uh, South Sudan has the highest maternal mortality rate. It was estimated to be 2,054 per 100,000 live births in 2008. Uh, the new estimate is around uh, 800 and 900, but even that, it still remains one of the highest uh, maternal mortality rates in the world. The infant mortality rate is extremely high. It is among the 10th highest countries, under five mortality of 135 per thousand, and HIV prevalence is slowly climbing up. It is currently around 3%. But in select groups like the army, it is still extremely high, going up to 8 9%. And uh, the problem with HIV is slowly creeping up and catching up with the rest of the East African countries like Uganda. Uh, people have very poor access to health systems. The immunization coverage uh, was 1.8% antenatal or prenatal coverage, 46%, and uh, skill attendant at delivery is only 14%. So women who have had at least one antenatal uh, visit with a skilled birth attendant, uh, just 30%. So you can see that poor people and people in remote locations have very limited access to the healthcare uh, system. Why training of health workers is crucial for developing countries, especially low-income, fragile countries like South Sudan. Africa, on the average, has 1.4 health workers per thousand population. This is far below the 4. Point, uh, per thousand uh, health workers required to achieve the sustainable development goals. South Sudan has far less, it has only 0.16 health workers per thousand uh, people population. And it's almost one tenth of even the African average. So that is the desperate situation that we find South Sudan in. So WHO estimates that on a need based uh, shortage of health workers for Africa to be around 6.5 million by 2030. Uh, this slide uh, shows you the situation in South Sudan. Uh, it was an estimate that was done around 2011 when uh, I first visited South Sudan. And uh, you can see that there's a huge gap. Uh, the, the column here shows you the situation in uh, 2011 and on, on the right side, the gap. And even then, it was estimated that we needed nearly 15,000 additional workers. Uh, there, are, there were only less than 100 uh, doctors in the whole country and uh, registered nurses, very few, and clinical officers also were very few. Uh, the more recent 2018 uh, Ministry of Health target is trying to uh, uh, improve the statistics to 2.3 health workers per thousand, which means that we need another 54,000 health workers to be trained. Um, but why is it so important to train? It is important to make and necessary to create a self-reliant and sustainable healthcare system in a country. Currently, uh, South Sudan is dependent mainly on expatriate health workers recruited from other African nations and from the developed world. Uh, this results in a reduced access of the population to health services. Since expat health workers remain in mainly in urban centers because of security concerns. Again, every time there is a shock or a, a renewed conflict or more recently uh, during the COVID pandemic, Many expat health workers had to leave, uh, resulting in a paralysis of the service. There's a sh if you want to shift from facility-based healthcare services to more community-oriented uh, or community-based primary healthcare, it is very crucial that 
national uh, health workers are developed. Uh, it is also necessary for building the state and for the whole overall development of the nation. So uh, how do you build resilience? Uh, when you come into a country, I think there are, I've categorized it into two types of uh, uh, interventions that you can provide or do. One I've referred to as state avoiding interventions. Uh, they tend to be, have a short term horizon. They rely mainly on external funding and are largely staffed by expat uh, people and uh, limited capacity orientation. They don't focus on building uh, capacity. And you find that many of the humanitarian uh, agencies that work in these fragile countries, the best example being uh, uh, MSF, uh, fall into this category. They are really not uh, interested in building the state. Whereas state building or health system strengthening interventions have a much longer horizon. They work with the local national authorities and the focus is on rebuilding the systems, the health system in the country. And this requires engaging uh, and providing services through the public health care system. Uh, it's important to mention that it's not only the numbers that matter, but it's also the skill mix. If you look at the uh, data that I presented earlier in the previous slide, you'll see that uh, the ratio of health workers is highly skewed. Uh, the greatest need, for example, in South Sudan at present is actually qualified nurses. Again, there is a, a issue of volume versus uh, quality of training. While there's a great need and demand to train more health workers, it is very important that uh, what we are doing is uh, building adequate clinical competency and not just uh, churning out numbers. So developing human resources through education and training is one aspect of addressing the problem. It's not everything. And so if you really want to make an impact, uh, you also need more comprehensive reforms in uh, the salaries, in the way people are deployed to different parts of the country, providing some of the basic uh, medical resources in these remote centers. How did we get involved in South Sudan? Uh, how did my wife Shalini and I uh, come to start working in South Sudan? In August 2011, I was part of an ICMD team which visited South Sudan under the leadership of Dr. Vinod Shah. After meeting with the Ministry of Health and many national agencies, including the Episcopal Church of South Sudan, the team identified that it would be strategic to be involved in training health workers or building human resources for South Sudan. So in February 2012, ICMDA signed a tripartite agreement with the Ministry of Health, the government of South Sudan and the Episcopal Church of uh, Sudan, uh, which is the main uh, church denomination in South Sudan. And the agreement was to establish a health training institute in Bor town of Jonglai state and to train a middle level cadre of health professionals. In 2012, uh, Shalni and I were approached by Dr. Vinod Shah and asked if we would consider leading this project. Uh, we, we thought about it because God had already uh, placed a seed in our uh, mind. Uh, but as we prayed about it a year later, we in 2013, we finally agreed. We kept asking ourselves, uh, we were already uh, nearly nearing 50 years of age and we were in uh, positions of leadership in the Emmanuel Hospital Association, uh, which is a fairly large uh, Indian organization. And we kept asking ourselves, is it the right time? Do we need to go? But uh, it's a question that comes back to you and 
finally we submitted and responded to this request uh, assuming that it was a call from god so these pictures uh, tell you of the journey uh, in 2011 the icmd team visiting south sudan the agreement uh, that was signed in february 2012 and finally in uh, 2014 we decided to take the move and uh, unfortunately that is just when the uh, conflict resumed in south sudan and so we had to relocate to kampala but it has been a journey of uh, trusting god and being obedient to his call uh, in this picture you see shalini and me in front of a, a metal boat uh, that was the boat in which the first christian missionaries uh, from the cms mission came to south sudan they took this boat all the way from khartoum and arrived in malek a small village near bor uh, almost 114 years because before we set foot in uh, south sudan uh, however god led us slowly into this uh, we spent our first four years in uganda in a more uh, secure and uh, environment and it helped us to learn the culture and slowly uh, learn how to work in africa and in 2018 we finally moved to bor town um the period 2014 to 18 uh, because of the resurgence of violence in 2013 the institute the icmd institute was started in kampala uganda in collaboration with the mengo hospital in kampala uh ni hsj as it was called the national institute of health sciences worked in partnership with nearly uh, 15 other learning partners many christian mission hospitals in uganda uh, 70 students were brought from south sudan from all the 10 states in south sudan and were uh, educated in uganda the outcome of this uh, first phase was that we graduated 67 students in 4 years uh, we trained 37 clinical officers 15 nurses and 15 midwives most of our graduates currently work in south sudan and they either work in the community as primary health centers or in programs and even in hospitals in some of the remote locations in the country they work with different ngos and the feedback that we have got from them is that the training has placed them a step ahead of many others and uh, many of them have risen to become mid level managers in their programs and are quickly uh, rising and assuming positions of leadership some of them have also uh, striving to become tutors themselves two are undergoing training uh, a tutorship training and two are working with us two of our graduates uh, have joined the institute in bor town today and are working as tutors there are many stories i can tell you of our graduates but uh, today i would like to share one story and that is of a midwife working in nuba mountains uh, jane sabir was a refugee in south sudan from the nuba mountains which is in still in sudan and uh, after completing and graduating from our institute she returned back to work in the nuba mountains in spite of all the risks and the ongoing conflict there uh, i was told that you know till almost a year ago there were still bombings going on uh, she has started training other community midwives and uses the training resources that she received at the icmd national institute of health sciences jonglei so uh, this gives you a glimpse of how these graduates are making a difference in the life of the community uh, where they work our current work uh, is in bor town and uh, in november 2018 shalini and i returned to bor town jonglai state uh, which is in the republic of south sudan 
we came on the invitation of the health minister of South Sudan and we were requested to re-establish the health training that we had started in uh, Uganda back in Bor town, uh, which was what the initial agreement required. Uh, the institute would now be under the Ministry of Health and would for, uh, work in collaboration with the State Ministry of Health. Since we did not have much funding, we had to adapt our model from a residential training program uh, with many partners to having uh, day students. We were promised some operational expenses and a small amount towards salaries of tutors, but we didn't have much money to begin with. And uh, we decided to introduce a small tuition fee of $80 per student every semester. But even then, uh, we were able to step out uh, in faith uh, knowing that God would provide. So in April 2019, we restarted the institute in a borrowed premises. There was a building called the Egyptian Clinic Building, which had been abandoned uh, in 2014. And it is adjacent to the compound of the State Bore Referral Hospital, which is also very important because it is the main clinical training site where we train uh, our students. The institute has been rechristened the Jonglai Health Sciences Institute. And uh, to begin with, it was only Shalini and me as medical tutors. And we had three administrative staff uh, who were deputed from the State Ministry of Health. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Shalini and me in front of the uh, board and uh, a picture of the Egyptian clinic building where we currently do our training and we currently train uh, two cadre of staff uh, that is uh, clinical officers and registered midwife they both do a diploma program a diploma in clinical medicine public health and a diploma in registered midwifery these are both three-year programs the clinical officers have to do an additional eight month compulsory internship and we decided to take uh, 20 in each group, that is 40 students. So this training that we are providing is a pre-service formal education program, and it is accredited to the National Ministry of Health, the Republic of South Sudan. Shalini and me are both members of the Principals Board of Health Science Institutions in South Sudan. And all our students take a common final qualifying examination, which is organized by the National Health Professionals Examination Board. So they qualify and uh, are formally recognized within the healthcare system of South Sudan. Uh, this is a picture with our students that was taken in 2019. And these are uh, some of our initial classes. You can see Shalini, uh, lecturing to the students and students sitting around taking we have about three classrooms uh, we try to develop critical thinking and problem solving skills and also try to encourage working in teams uh, that's picture of uh, a demonstration uh, of the heart on a anatomy of the heart on a cow's heart and then we also using certain anatomical models, we use videos. And more recently, we are trying to develop our e-learning resources. Uh, students also are encouraged to do role plays. We try to liven up the learning process. Uh, we also have a community orientation program in which uh, we take the students and they live in the uh, a village nearby and trying to understand health from a community perspective. So they do uh, village household surveys. Students live with the tutors in the village for two weeks. And then they do an analysis of the situation and then they present their results and findings uh, which are shared among all the other students. Uh, much of the clinical training is done at the Bohr State Referral Hospital which is uh, very old. I mean, it's it was built in the 50s by the British and uh, not very limited infrastructure. So you can see a 
maternal clinic, a prenatal clinic under the mango tree. And uh, this is a picture of our midwifery students actually uh, monitoring a pregnant woman in delivery. Uh, we also have extracurricular activities. We have organized a students uh, council and a guild. And this was from a recent track and field event at the students guild week. We also organize annual spiritual retreats. Uh, one of our friends, Reverend Sonny Philip, uh, talking to them of, about the kingdom of God. Uh, medical education has the potential to be transformational. And I'm going to discuss this in the next few slides on why uh, we don't just see it as uh, building health workers, but our attempt has always been from the beginning to be transformational. Uh, Christian higher education has a greater calling to propel students and faculty towards a life where faith is fully integrated with one's vocation. And in this process of uh, higher education, uh, we are trying to influence and affect the student's life in all areas. And our hope is basically that we will be able to shape a distinctive uh, Bible-inspired worldview. Uh, Charlene Kalinsky, in her article, Calling Students to Transformation, argues that education should be viewed as a transformative process because, and it needs to challenge the entirety of the student. Uh, how do we do this transformative learning? Uh, I just want to emphasize that it is not about smart teaching methodology. It's not about adult uh, education. But more importantly, it is about constantly questioning the students' assumptions, their beliefs and values, and contrasting it with biblical standards and values. Uh, we try to confront them with disorienting dilemmas. What is a disorienting dilemma? Uh, I think the best example for this would be from the Bible. Uh, when Jesus asks his disciples to feed, feed the multitude, there were 5,000 people gathered there. And then he asked them, why don't you feed them? And they were uh, in a dilemma. How do we provide for them? We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. What do we do? And uh, so similarly, uh, you, in the course of the three years, uh, our students are faced with different dilemmas, which makes them uh, consider and reevaluate their own assumptions and uh, problems. We also share from our own real life experiences and we are constantly referring them to the context in which they're going to be working and also the greater purpose, God's purpose for them. Uh, is it possible to actually uh, do transformational education along with technical or do these happen separately? Uh, Co-centering transformational learning uh, alongside a traditional or conventional adult learning methods is possible. Uh, and we do it through group discussions. We have a lot of authentic and thick discussions where we talk about the socio-cultural context in South Sudan, the relevance of what we are teaching. And we try to move them from the how and when to why. We use a lot of storytelling, experience sharing, Field trips have been important in the past, case study methodology. And it's very important to get the student to reflect on what uh, the content that is being taught. What does this mean to me? What does it mean to my community? What does this mean to my country? Uh, we didn't start off with a structured framework for doing this uh, kind of education. We just visualized certain outcomes that we wanted to see happening, the change that we wanted to see happening in our students. Uh, one was we wanted to develop a, a, a sense of calling a missional perspective to their work so that they see it as a vocation and not just another uh, job. 
or a means of livelihood. We wanted them to become active learners, the ability to uh, critically analyze problems and also to ha adapt to the complex environment in which they are often called to work. We wanted to develop a God-centered moral ethical framework, not only for their work, but for the whole of their lives. And underpinning all this is spiritual transformation, really. And so we prayed and we encouraged them to live an authentic relationship with God. And this requires a, a reorientation of their worldview. Some lessons for Christian medical mission uh, that we would like to share. One is fragile nations like South Sudan must become the focus of Christian medical mission today. Nearly 40 million people all over the world live as refugees or have been displaced from their country. They are migrant workers in different countries and it is extremely important to reach out to these people. In fragile countries, especially in situations where the legitimacy of the government is in question or the government becomes dysfunctional, it is crucial that to focus our nation building through non-state organizations like the national churches. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has a, been a clear demonstration that healthcare and development need to go together and building a fair and effective health systems cannot only be done by the government and uh, not even with the support of major UN agencies or international NGOs. Uh, just to give you an example, there's so much talk about uh, vaccine inequity and the fact that many African countries have less than 2% immunization against COVID. But uh, it is not just a question of making available uh, the COVID vaccine to these countries. Because as you saw from the statistics earlier, when only three or four percent of the children are immunized, uh, when only 20 percent or 30 percent of women get antenatal care, how are you actually going to reach out to 100 percent of the population? So just going by these statistics, it looks that you can only reach 30 to 40 percent even if you sink a vast amount of resources into these countries. You cannot build a healthcare system uh, suddenly in a year's time or in two years time, how much you invest in it. And this requires development in, with a long-term perspective. So let us uh, not waste our time uh, debating the relevance of Christian medical mission in today's world. Uh, let's try to uh, avoid this grasshopper mentality. Uh, let us uh, talk about revitalizing the Christian engagement with the hurting world. Medical missions need to focus on building local capacity in the healthcare systems through education and to especially focus on developing young national health professionals. Uh, medical and nursing education is a great need, but it should not be seen just as merely technology transfer, but it should be transformational uh, so that it multiplies and grows. Uh, medical education must focus on developing multi-competent health providers who are relevant to their context. And this requires moving beyond just content delivery. Um, many people have approached us with uh, excellent content, but that is not sufficient to bring about transformation. Transformational education often happens outside the classroom. And so it is important that we also embrace extracurricular activities. A question that most people have asked me is, does it really work? I mean, it all sounds good uh, talking about transformational education, but does it really work? Uh, I'm sure that it may not work with all students. I don't think we will uh, be able to transform all our students, but 
we have definitely been able to sow a seed and uh, we must believe that ideas have consequences and the power to change so uh, it is important that as a team we believe that it is possible to bring about transformation uh, it may not happen as extensively or as quickly as we uh, would like it to happen but we must believe that god will bless it and the seeds that have been sown will one day uh, grow to transform this nation I'd like to end this uh, presentation with a, a beautiful Dinka hymn, which is so apt for our current situation. And it reads, cover us with your wings, like a bird covers her chicks. Embrace us intimately, O God, hold us intimately in these bad years, so that we may have life through faith in you, O God. Uh, this was translated by Mark Nichols, an American missionary to the Dinka. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank you all for listening in. And I want to thank especially our supporters and our friends in, in UK, USA, Canada and uh, Australia who have generously supported us and prayed for us and uh, it is their support which has sustained us especially uh, in the transition from uganda to south sudan and in these last few years and uh, we want to specially mention anglican international development who have been closely behind our work supporting our work our friends in the u.s uh, Emmanuel Hospital Association Canada and HealthServe and uh, MMA from Australia. Uh, I want to thank also the ICMDA for giving me this opportunity and organizing uh, this webinar. And I hope that many of you uh, will reach out to us. I mean, uh, many have asked how can we help and I'd be grateful to answer your questions directly. So you could email me at anilcherian at gmail.com. Thank you, everyone. This brings back um, many memories for me. I was, I was not uh, a member of this team that went to Sudan, but uh, those of you who are close to ICMDA will recognize, of course, not just Vinod Shah, who led ICMDA for eight years as CEO, a surgeon and previous EHA leader, from, uh, from India, uh, whose idea it was initially. And of course, uh, Dr. Kevin Vaughan, many of our UK people and others around the world will know, will know him as well, a previous chairman of ICMDA. So ICMDA was very much involved in this project right from the start and uh, helped to initiate it and get it all going. Josh, I see we've got Alex Bolek uh, listening to us here. I wonder if we could possibly bring Alex in. So I wonder, Alex, if I, if I can just ask you, not everyone will know who you are. Alex is the ICMDA Regional Secretary for East Africa. He's based in South Sudan and leads, leads the team there. And you saw him in those pictures right at the very beginning. Alex, you're, you're a doctor and one of very few in South Sudan. What sort of impact have you seen from this ministry so far in terms of the 67 people who've been trained from, from your perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been um, a, a, a very interesting journey and um, I, all, all, all related to ICMDA. I first met um, uh, Dr. Vinod and Dr. Kevin in Uruguay in the World Congress. So when they thought of coming to South Sudan, they said, okay, who, who is our contact on ground? And through the network of ICMDA, they were told Alex is already on ground uh, in Juba. <laughs> and a and, um, few months after the, the World Congress in Uruguay, uh, I happily received them uh, from Juba airport. And there the journey started. We, uh, I took them to the Ministry of Health and we had meetings with the Anglican church. And the thing that came up 
uh, as the express need in, the, in those meetings was uh, training mid-level health cadres to, to cover the gap or to, to bridge the gap. Because as uh, Anil has shown you in the, in the numbers, there's a huge gap uh, of health cadres in South Sudan. So the express need was uh, training. And uh, because uh, most of the uh, regions of South Sudan have already training institutes for uh, training mid-level health cadres on Labor or uh, Greater Upper Nile region uh, has no any institution. So MOH and the Minister of Health that time said, you, you, we, we want to send you to Jongole area to start the school there because there are already training institutions in, in other parts of South Sudan. So we went to Bor and we were shown a place there where we would uh, start building the institute. But unfortunately in 2013, uh, the crisis started. The crisis started after we had already done uh, uh, intake for students. So we were wondering what to do, what to do after that. And uh, while we were praying together, we, this idea came to our minds that why don't we ship this, this school to Uganda? And uh, through our partners in Uganda, uh, we got in touch with Mango Hospital, which is a Christian hospital, and we moved the school to, to Uganda. So for the last few years, the school has been uh, operating from Uganda side. Um, and now uh, I think we graduated in Uganda, like two batches, those 67 students were graduated in Uganda. Uh, and when the relative peace returned, uh, we decided to bring the school back. And now uh, we handed the, we technically handed the school back to the government, but Dr. Anil and uh, Dr. Shalini uh, from ICMDA are still uh, giving support to the school and they are now running the school for the government of South Sudan. So we are really uh, excited. This is, um, uh, this is a, a, a wonderful uh, project. Uh, our graduates are now scattered all over South Sudan and some of them, as Anil said, they, we keep track of them. And there are a lot of good testimonies about these uh, wonderful young uh, men and young women uh, doing a, a wonderful work. Others have joined the NGOs work and they are uh, making a great impact. One of them, uh, okay, there they are, wonderful. So wonderful. please keep talking, Alex. It, it's, it really, you, you'll be getting the idea what an extraordinary event or, or process this has been from, from uh, the Lord's sovereign leading of, of uh, Alex meeting Kevin and, and Vinod back in Uruguay and South America at an ICMDA Congress in 2010, getting an idea uh, making this connection, and then the extraordinary progress through incredible difficulties politically, governance-wise, but particularly the war that immediately after the school was to be established, the country was then engulfed in war for two years, and then this ingenious decision, again by the Lord's leading, to move the whole school to Uganda in order to bring these people back again uh, to serve their country. Um, Alex, can I just ask, it's been incredible right at the beginning of this project how closely you've worked with government and how you've gained the confidence of, of government in terms of supporting this project. And as Anil was saying, many Christian initiatives are, are carried out often in the periphery without any connection with the political processes. But how did that happen uh, right at the beginning that you managed to get all these high-level contacts to make the decisions necessary to put the school into process. Yeah, I've uh, got some amazing connections. Um, I was, uh, I, in the beginning, I was working for the Minister of Health. Uh, so um, it was not really difficult for me to get access to, uh, to people uh, high up there in the Minister of Health. So uh, each time I come to the ministry, if I want to see uh, the undersecretary or the director general or, or the minister, I don't have to make an appointment. I just come and walk in as soon as they know Alex is at the door, they just say, let him in. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I was part of the Ministry of Health and, um, and I was also a bridge uh, with the church and um, um, I'm, I'm also uh, connected to the local church in South Sudan. So I know most of the leaders uh, in the churches of South Sudan. And each time I come, if I want to see the archbishop or the bishop or whoever is there, 
they, I don't have to also to make an appointment. I, I come and I walk in. And so those connections uh, work out perfectly well for us. So each time we want to meet somebody up there, we, uh, I just come with Anil and, uh, and Dr. Shalini and we, and we meet them. So that, uh, so in part, because I was a part of Ministry of Health, that helped a lot uh, with, uh, with, 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 with the connections and all the meetings until we sign, until we sign the MOU with the, uh, uh, with the with the with the, the tripartite MOU with the MOH and the and the Anglican Church of South Sudan, so that in part um, uh, was was really helpful, and also from the Uganda side, uh, in 2017 I became the regional secretary for East Africa, and I got connected to most of the uh, national fellowship leaders in the region and uh, our brothers in on ground in Uganda, uh, Papa and. Um, and, and others, I got to know them. So um, I, uh, Anil, when Anil and um, and Shalini came to, to Kampala, uh, they in a minute they were easily introduced to the to the team on ground, which also gave them uh, a lot of support. So I can see uh, these divine connections and this divine network of uh, uh, of ICMDA field workers. Uh, what I want really to say is that uh, uh, as a South Sudanese, I want to say a big thank you to ICMDA. I think uh, when I met um, uh, um, Dr. Erma in, uh, in Uganda a few years ago, when we were graduating some of the students, I, uh, he told me, you know, as ICMDA, this is the first time we have done any training. And I think South Sudan is really privileged <laughs> to, have, to have this offer from ICMDA. Um, I, I, ICMDA has not done any such training in any, uh, in any country around the world, but we are really, as uh, South Sudanese, we are grateful and grateful to ICMDA uh, for this great support to the country in such a time as this, in such a time of need for healthcare um, uh, uh, workers. And um, um, on, so on behalf of my people, uh, I'm part of ICMDA, but I, I also speak here as a South Sudanese. <laughs> I, on, on behalf of my South Sudanese people, I want to, to say a big thank you to ICMDA for this uh, project and for this initiative, which has now become a, a big blessing to the whole country. A few weeks ago, I was in, uh, in Bor uh, to visit Anil uh, and Shalini. And as I chatted with the leaders there, they, how much they are so appreciative uh, of Dr. Anil and, uh, and Dr. Shalini because they are also providing not only uh, the training, but they also help medically uh, with other health, health services in the, in the community and in the town of Bor. Stephen, I wonder if you can hear us, if, if you just like to, can you give your perspective of how this all happened from, your, from, from way back? Just introduce yourself first of all, and then uh, give us your brief perspective okay. on the Sudan School. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Stephen Muhudia. Um, in I, I work in Nairobi, Kenya. A member of uh, CMF Kenya, uh, which is uh, an affiliate of uh, the ICMDA. And uh, at the time that I was on the on the team that visited Bora, I think the second visit, and in one of the pictures I was with uh, Anil in the progress of the program, and uh, was with uh, Anil when he was on his way from India to start the program in Bor, South Sudan, when the civil war or the war broke in, uh, in South Sudan, I think at the end of 2013. So in 2014, he had to stay in Nairobi for about uh, four weeks or more, uh, try, waiting for the war to subside uh, so that he could travel to South Sudan. So it has been a great journey. I was uh, fortunate to be invited to the, first uh, to the first graduation in Uganda, and it was uh, very encouraging seeing the, the team that had been trained in exile uh, in, so to say, in Uganda, uh, when they had been preparing to be trained in South Sudan. And it is uh, uh, with great, 
uh, it's really a great achievement that the training was able to go back to, to, to be carried out. And so I say that this is a, a good example of commitment as a missionary in a foreign land. We're experiencing some of the joys of uh, internet connections that some sometimes are seen in East Africa. Uh, so bearing with us. Alex, I wonder, are you able to answer that question? Uh, just give us an idea of the clinical officers who've been trained. What, what sort of settings are they working in now? Yeah, um, th thanks, Peter. Uh, the coronel keeps the records uh, of the distribution of those uh, uh, graduates from our school. Uh, so there are some of them who have joined the NGOs. Uh, for instance, I know two of them in Rumbek town who have uh, who have joined uh, uh, one of the uh, international organizations and providing uh, health services in the communities around around Rumbek. But uh, and here in Juba, I also met a few of them who work in uh, primary health care centers for, for the government and also for NGOs. And uh, but. Um, I don't have the the distribution tables as to uh, in 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 which hospital, in which uh, health facility, in which organization uh, are, are they are they all working? But we know that all of the 67 uh, who graduated from Uganda side are all now working in South Sudan uh, for the government and for for and for NGOs. But. Only, only that distribution list, I don't have, have it before me now, so I can't tell okay. you that information. Thanks, but you've given us a very good idea of the, the kind of context in which they're working. Uh, Anil, can you hear us? Okay, well, Alex, I wonder if I might. Uh, yes. Anil, yeah. Um, do you want to add anything to that, uh, the question about where the yeah. graduate clinical officers are working, what kind of context? Yeah, most of them work for government uh, and NGO run programs. Uh, very few of our clinics, most of them don't work in private clinics. A few have clinics in remote areas. Can you tell us um, another question here? Can you tell us about church based clinics and the and the role that they play in in uh, South Sudan healthcare delivery. We know in many sub-Saharan countries, it's the church hospitals and clinics which play a major role. Is, is that the case in Sudan and how effective are they? Yeah, the situation in South Sudan is that uh, there are very few uh, active church-run uh, and uh, because they have not had the advantage establishing it because the, the baseline is very few health centers uh, run by Christians yeah. and the Christian church. Uh, so, but I just want to stress and emphasize that uh, in the present context of South Sudan, I see it as very crucial. In fact, when the government is almost dysfunctional, and uh, when the health systems are taking a lot of uh, time to actually uh, sort out their problems, I think it is extremely crucial that uh, the church uh, gets involved. In one of my latest slides, which you can check, this is uh, one of the points that I would like to make, that the church really needs to get involved in healthcare in South Sudan. Thank you so much again for joining us on ICMDA webinars today. Again, apologies for the uh, difficulties we've had in transmission. Thanks very much to Dr. Alex Bolek and Dr. Stephen Mahudia, who stepped in at short notice, very short notice, in order to give their perspectives on this amazing uh, work of God with extraordinary timing and connections and bringing so many people together. And uh, we hope you will no doubt have had a glimpse of the extraordinary work that's been done and continues to be done and what, uh, what can be done by God's people when they're willing to count the cost, to step out in faith, to hear his voice and work together
to his glory. And, and I'm sure this is only just the beginning of a story. And isn't it just like the Lord to, to work in places that we might not expect? Jesus started in Galilee, not Jerusalem. And this work began in South Sudan, one of the most needy places, and perhaps one of the most unlikely places that we might think of to, to start it. So uh, thank you again if you're born with us through this, and uh, we hope you've been inspired by at least what you've heard today. God bless you all, and thank you.